Hello, um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Head of Port of Antiquities and Treasure um, at the British Museum. When I hear Donald Trump uh, use his catchphrase, let's make America great again, I wonder when that was. Um, and thankfully, in my office, I have an American colleague who reminds me of the various possibilities of when America was great. And I've now built a little Lego wall um, between our desks, so he can have his views and I can have mine. But often fencing off a, a view and pretending it doesn't exist um, rarely solves anything. Uh, many apologies if the title of my talk is a little bit provocative, but I hope it allows us to consider what we, um, as archaeologists, really want from the metal detecting community, if anything. Whether or not metal detecting or the metal detecting scene was ever great uh, really doesn't matter too much. What's important now is the possibility that it could be, and by this I mean also great for archaeology. The Boards of Antiquity Scheme has been very successful in encouraging voluntary uh, reporting of archaeological objects discovered by the public, as well as supporting the mandatory reporting of treasure under the Treasure Act 1996. Before the Portable Antiquity Scheme was established, there was no mechanism to record archaeological finds made by the public in England and Wales, um, though some items may have been logged by local museums or with um, sites and monument records, which we now know as historic environment records. To date, the Portable Antiquity Scheme database holds over 1.4 million archaeological finds on its database. And this is an important uh, data set, especially for archaeologists, but also for anyone interested in the past. Furthermore, the Portable Antiquity Scheme database has proven to be a, a powerful research tool, um, though very much in need of uh, an update to make it great again. Indeed, we're actively seeking funding to rebuild the database, which is going to cost as much as half a million pounds. It's generally agreed that the PS has revolutionised archaeology in England and Wales, even if the data collected is only a proportion of the actual objects found. And I'm going to return to this uh, in a moment. Many of the people finding the objects recorded through the Port of Antiquity Scheme, about 90% of the total number, are metal detector users. Most archaeologists recognise the value of metal detecting if undertaken responsibly, i.e. in accordance with the baseline of best practice outlined in the Code of Practice for Responsible Metal Detecting in England and Wales. This is especially the case when metal detecting takes place on cultivated land, where fines are particularly vulnerable to corrosion and agricultural damage. But it should be recognised that metal detecting can bring to light sites of archaeological interest unlikely to be discovered through conventional archaeological methods. It's apparent, nonetheless, that not all metal detectorists record their discoveries or even follow other aspects of what's considered to be best practice. Indeed, it's a fundamental flaw of our permissive approach to metal detecting that it's down to the individual choice, not the state's insistence, whether a finder follows best practice and therefore whether their discovery contributes to our knowledge of the past or not. Now, to, to date, more than 22,000 individuals have recorded um, the 1.4 million fines with the Port of Antiquity Scheme, which is a significant number, especially given it's generally estimated there are about 10 to 15,000 detectorists in the UK. This is even more significant if it's reckoned that only a small proportion of individuals are likely to detect frequently. An important fact, however, is that of the total number of people that have recorded fines with the Port of Antiquity Scheme, two-thirds have recorded less than 10 fines, and only 1% of the total have recorded more than 500 items. It's therefore apparent that whilst the Port of Antiquity Scheme has been successful in engaging with many detectorists, only a small proportion report all their findings, though it's possible some of these finders only discover modern material or they lack competence in actually metal detecting. A further point is that fines liaison officers are necessarily selective in what they record, and inevitably it might be the case that they find some detectorists easier to engage with than others. In the detecting community, these detectorists are sometimes known as pet finders. Whatever the case, the failure of some metal detectorists to report archaeological finds with the Portable Antiquity Scheme 
together with the fact that the PAS lacks resources to record all archaeological objects found, represents a loss to our heritage, a loss that's hard to determine. Educational outreach has been fundamental to the work of the Portable Antiquity Scheme and its local network of fines liaison officers. It's important to note that fines liaison officers are locally employed and managed, through though the scheme is um, overseen centrally by us at the British Museum. Indeed, the Portable Antiquity Scheme is a partnership project, bringing together many organisations and different people. Over the years, detectors have been persuaded to record their finds when previously they were sceptical to do so. It's well known that relations between archaeologists and the detecting community has vastly improved since the days of Stop Taking Our Past campaign of the 1980s, though old prejudices, of course, die hard. There also remain sensitivities about who has access to find spot data. Most detectorists are, of course, most worried about other detectorists knowing where they search, but the potential impact of archaeological interest in what they've found is also a concern to some, especially if it's at odds with the perceived interests of landowners. Like all the aspects of society, the detecting community is diverse. At one end of the spectrum are those individuals, probably a small proportion, who faithfully follow the code. Some of these, just a small proportion of the total, also record their discoveries, following training and with the support of their local finds liaison officer directly onto the Portable Antiquity Scheme database, and we call these um, self-recorders. They're training funded as part of the Heritage Lottery Fund um, Past Explorers project, finds recording in the local community. Besides these finders, probably representing the vast majority of detectors, are those who are generally happy to record what they discover, but are not particularly proactive in doing so. For example, they will normally wait for the finds liaison officer to attend their meetings um, to record their discoveries, rather than proactively seek out the finds liaison officer, unless they've found something particularly important. And I would call these passive recorders. At the other end of the spectrum are those who show little regard for finds recording and may detect purely for financial gain. Some of these individuals with little interest in the past might also be engaged in illegal activity. It's important to note that many of the passive recorders will also sell their fines, though financial gain might not, not necessarily be their primarily their primary sorry, motivation for metal detecting. Indeed, understanding what motivates people to detect is a complex issue, which I'm not going to venture into here. But it can be the case that some who talk the talk in terms of responsible metal detecting might not also walk the walk. And some who seem to lack interest in archaeology actually might be more responsible than others. Given this situation of people detecting with various attitudes and motivations, it's somewhat an injustice that the archaeological community, or even the public more generally, tends to lump the detecting community together as one, therefore not properly recognising the important contribution to archaeological knowledge of those detectorists who are the most responsible. Considering this, the rest of my talk will suggest new ways for engaging with the detecting community that better provides for those who are most responsible, perhaps, though, at the expense of the activities of those that are detri most detrimental, detrimental to our heritage. It's, fortunate, it's a fortunate coincidence that the DCMS is now um, consulting on the review of the Treasure Act. Um, the focus of the review is wide-ranging, looking at specific details of the Act and, is and its associated code of practice, as well as floating some much larger ideas that are clearly designed to provoke discussion for the future. Inevitably, much of the archaeological interest is in the proposed changes to the definition of treasure, and this too has been the focus of the detecting community. For rather practical reasons, the government has suggested that the rolling end date for treasure, currently anything over 300 years old, is cut off at 1714. It's all proposed, also proposed that single gold coins of the Roman, early medieval, and parts of the medieval period up to the reform of gold coinage under Edward III, should be treasure. Also, that base metal Roman assemblages in discrete archaeological deposits should be covered by the Act. Most controversial of the proposed changes is that which says that items, archaeological items, valued over £10,000 should also be treasure. The government's aim is to protect finds which are archaeologically important but not precious metal. A good example is the Crosby Garrett helmet, 
which sold, was sold by Christie's for £2.3 million and is now in a private collection rather than in a museum. It had been proposed by the DCMS that something akin to the Waverley criteria for exports of works of art might be applied to treasure finds, but the government lawyers believed that this was unworkable, and, and maybe they would consider that, who knows. But the objection to, by many archaeologists to the va uh, value-based proposal is primary, primarily, of course, a moral one, that we should not judge an object's importance based on its financial value. Detectorists generally seem to agree, though this might reflect a general desire to resist the act covering new classes of fines and further con um, containing previously enjoyed liberties. Consequently, it would seem the proposal is on the rocks, unless another solution can be um, found, and therefore future discoveries like the Crosby Garrett helmet would find themselves on the open market. Otherwise, the review deals with normalising the treasure process to better reflect current practice giving the enforcement agencies some extra powers to deal with those that fail to report treasure through implementing some aspects of the Coroner's and Justice Act in relation to treasure, and also exempting the Church of England of some obligations under the Act, which can be covered under its own existing processes and procedures. Of perhaps more interest to us are some fairly general thoughts or proposals on how the treasure process might develop in the future. These are clearly designed to prompt further debate rather than lead to any immediate action. Here the government has looked to heritage protection legislation from across the United Kingdom for inspiration. First, should all archaeological finds belong to the state, as in Scotland? Here, there's no suggestion for the process um, or procedures um, are offered, but it's kind of floated, if you like. Second, it's proposed that the detecting community will, should benefit from um, training. Again, it's not suggested what this could be and how it might work. And third, should those wishing to excavate be required to have a permit to do so, at, with a nod to current practice in Northern Ireland, where all archaeological finds must be, um, or archaeological excavations must be sanctioned. Here it's important to note that in Northern Ireland, individuals can detect without a licence if they are looking for non-archaeological material. So there's obviously a potential loophole there. As has previously been noted, educational outreach already happens. The Portable Antiquity Scheme seeks to reach out to as many detectorists as possible to encourage, to, um, encourage them to follow best practice, including recording fines. Traditionally, fines liaison officers have attended metal detecting cl clubs to record fines, but in recent years, that activity has declined. One reason for this is that some clubs are less receptive to fines recording than independent detectorists, that's to say detectorists not in clubs. So fines liaison officers have preferred to set up fine surgeries to engage with a wider community or even through social media. Through past explorers, it's apparent that several detectorists are keen to develop their skills and also have the opportunity to identify and record their own fines. Indeed, some finders feel an obligation to better support the recording process which is especially useful given the PS staff uh, full recording capacity. In my view, this doesn't seem to be an unreasonable expectation of the detecting community. We certainly believe that amateur archaeologists should probably record and write up the sites that they survey and excavate, though we know that doesn't always happen. So there's an opportunity here. In line with the aims of the proposed Institute for Detectorists to support knowledge and skills of detectorists through workshops and skill days, for example, Courses could include training in the principles of archaeological fieldwork, how to effectively use a metal detector, and identify and record small finds. In my view, as archaeologists, we should embrace any attempts to encourage detectorists to gain a better appreciation of best practice and make metal detecting great. Somewhat related to this is the need for the, um, detectorists to develop their role as landscape investigators. It's apparent that where a finder has, um, has a close relationship and understanding of the land that they search on, then the dividends are greater for the individual, but also for our understanding of the historic environment. Conversely, where finders do not have any affinity to the land which they search, such as on large-scale metal detecting rallies, it's apparent that the principles of best practice are less likely to be observed, and therefore damage to archaeology is more likely. I therefore argue that it's best for detectors to search on places closest to where they live or where they have particular relationships to better develop a sense of place and preserve um, or best serve the local community. 
By this route, I think it's more likely that discoveries will be shared with local people and perhaps the finds even donated to local museums, if they're relevant. In some areas of Europe, such as in Flanders, the Netherlands, and some German states, even in Sweden, metal detecting is licensed or only allowed by a permit. The ways these permit schemes operate varies considerably, from being nothing more than a box-ticking exercise to being almost impossible to access. Clearly, for licensing schemes to work effectively, there needs to be a recognition that detecting has a contribution to make to archaeology, that archaeologists openly recognise this contribution, and that those granted licences will behave in a way that adds value to archaeological knowledge. It's also important that such licences should bring benefits to those given permits to detect, which might include special access to land of archaeological interest, i.e. where a controlled detecting survey would be useful, access to expertise, such as fines and <coughs> conservation support, being invited to museum and archaeological events, such as special exhibitions, talks and lectures, and of course training. In short, I believe a liberal licensing scheme could help make metal detecting great by ensuring that all those that search are clear on the rules and the requirements of best practice. And that this would also help mark out those who do want to do things responsibly. This approach, to the get, together with a degree of self-regulation which has been lacking in, in, over many years now, has worked well with the Society of Thames Mudlarks, who must have a Port of London Authority permit to search the Thames foreshore. There is an argument that the Treasure Act has commercialised archaeological finds. The reward basis of the Act was designed to encourage best practice, but has, probably inadvertently, raised expectations amongst many finders of the monetary value of their discoveries. The experience of those who have a close relationship to the valuation process is that finders' expectations are so high that they mostly must trust the independent valuations placed on finds by the Treasure Valuation Committee. Indeed, it begs the question whether these valuations were nominal, the finders would complain any less. There is also a resource implication here, given the rewards need to be paid from public money, whether that be from museums or the funding bodies. Finders and landowners would probably not accept valuations of finds being completely divorced from their market value, however appealing that might be to archaeologists. However, a third way might be for finds to be valued on their bullion value. Maybe it doesn't work for coins, but it's the Viking way. This would ensure a fair value, but not trying to link financial value with an archaeological value. This system is probably more akin to what they use in Denmark, Danafe. In summary, I therefore feel that a stick besides a carrot is needed to help metal detecting grade. Focus training as part of a license scheme for detectorists and a rewards process that compensates finders and landowners but one that doesn't try and place a market value on fines. Whether you agree with uh, me or not, it doesn't really matter in a way, but do feed on your thoughts to the DCMS consultation on the review of the Treasure Act, which closes at the end of the month. Thank you.